Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, students and faculty. I'm delighted to be here, even this early. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I'm a guest in the unceded land and territory of the Buganda, Kingdom of Buganda. I must also thank our research team, both in Canada and in Uganda, for their convictions and for always holding us accountable to the voices and stories of our research participants, however painful. Most importantly, I must acknowledge our research participants for courageously sharing their stories. Before I jump into the heady stuff, I wanted to talk a little bit about my mentorship by Professor Soen Kombo. He has known me and mentored me for 27 years. I think he will likely tell you I was a bit of a challenge. When I first came to Uganda, um, I had shifted my PhD story. I was initially working in, with a First Nation in Northern Alberta, um, but that study kind of fell through for several reasons. And Professor Sue Combo and a Canadian colleague of his had started a study, a qualitative study in 1992 in a truck stop trading center called the Entonde. So I had never been to Uganda. And my first introduction to Professor Sue Combo was on the day I arrived. And the very next day, he took me to the Entonde uh, have, have you guys ever been to Leandonte? Yes. yes. Perfect. So he took me to Leandonte the very next day and he left me there. <laughs> and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, he uh, has been with me throughout my entire career, uh, from PhD to postdoc, to assistant prof, to associate prof, and to full professor. He has helped me to navigate, as you guys probably know, um, HIV research is quite political, um, but he's also really helped me to navigate the politics of the university settings. Unfortunately, at UBC, only 25% of the full professors are women. And without his early wise practice and his early mentorship, I am convinced that that glass ceiling would have been so much harder to break. So I know he's not here, but I thank him immensely. Thank you. Oh, he's right there. He missed it. <laughs> That's okay. But you see, now you don't know what I said, Prof. <laughs> I understand that many of you are students and are in the process of finding your place in what can be a complicated, uncertain research world. So I wanted to bring to your attention some work that my students back in Canada are really raving about. Sean Wilson is a Cree man from Manitoba, Canada, who is currently living in Australia. His work highlights the notion that our research relationships do not just shape our realities, they are our reality. It is, his, it is his assertion that the research that we do by and for indigenous and tribal people must be treated as ceremony, where we strengthen our relationships and raise our levels of consciousness and insights into our worlds. Viewing research as ceremony represents our commitment to be our best selves by holding up the moral authority, ethics, and worldviews of the people with whom we work. As many of you I know can attest to, much of the very Eurocentric research conducted both here in Uganda and with Indigenous people in Canada aided the colonial process and indeed contributed to oppressive practices. Increasingly, communities all over the world are asserting their power by demanding that the research conducted in their communities follow their protocols and honor their worldviews and knowledges. Seen in this way, viewing research as ceremony can contribute in part to the decolonization of the research process. This means a resolute commitment to the understanding that research relationships define us for the rest of our lives. It is a common understanding that many peoples feel that they have been researched to death. 
and it's it's that's a big feeling um, with Native people in the Americas, but also in Canada as well. And many speak to the fact that it's high time that we research ourselves back to life. Gone are the days when community members, knowledge keepers, and elders serve in only advisory capacity. And the researcher can walk away and do whatever they want anyway, which is actually often the case. As community members and knowledge keepers take back control over the research process, community advisory boards are undergoing significant transformations. Research in the communities we serve are no longer talking about advising, we are talking about governance. The process of decision making, the processes of implementation, and the processes of accountability. In global health research all over the world, governance bodies are now be being formed to provide complete oversight to the research process. They set the priorities, are involved in the formulation of the research questions, they are approving study protocols, addressing critical ethical issues, supporting the interpretation of results and findings, and more importantly, supporting knowledge translation strategies that are consistent with community needs, values, and knowledges. They are also defining on how to bring research out to the rest of the world, particularly very sensitive stuff. For the CEDAR project, a study I'm about to talk to you about, we're also running a mentoring program whereby Indigenous members who sit on our governance also mentor our PhD students. This experience has been invaluable to them. Now to help situate these, con these concepts, governance, safety, reciprocal accountability, I want to take a little bit of time to introduce two ongoing studies and some of their significant findings. Since 2003, the CEDAR project has examined connections between ongoing impacts of colonization and intergenerational trauma on HIV and hepatitis C infection among young indigenous, indigenous people who use illicit non-injection non and injection drugs in BC. And by illicit drugs, we're not talking about marijuana. We're talking about cocaine, crack, um, heroin. And I think that if any of you have done any um, walkabouts in Vancouver, you'll see that Vancouver's downtown east side is our poorest postal code in Canada. And that's where a lot of drug-related harm has occurred. This community-driven community Longitudinal cohort has received continuous CIHR funding and to our knowledge is the only study of its kind globally. We celebrated our 15th year this year. The name CEDAR is not an acronym. The participants in the study are from various nations and from different language groups from all across the country. So finding a name for this study was a little bit difficult. However, CEDAR considered the tree of life is used by all nations in making boxes, coffins, building shelters, canoes, and is an important part of ritual process, including smudging, and is a key part of medicine bundles for traditional healers. We named the study the Cedar Project because to all nations in all tribal areas, cedar is a metaphor for healing. And I think there are many cedar trees in Uganda as well. So, one key facet of the colonial project in Canada was legislation put into force regarding residential schools. In 1984, the government of, or, sorry, 1894, the government of Canada passed what was called the Gradual Civilization Act. This was an act of, of assimilation. By 1910, it was also the law that every single indigenous child must be removed from their homes and per put into church state run boarding schools very far away from their home communities. Canada's policy was to kill the Indian in the child. And for generations, all sorts of abuses were perpetrated against these defenseless children. If they spoke their own language, sewing needles were stuck through their tongues. Thousands and thousands of children experienced emotional, sexual, and physical abuse perpetrated by those in power, 
but mostly by the missionary teachers. Many, many children die trying to run back home. And if their parents tried to hide them, they were arrested and put into jail. In all, there were 22 residential schools in British Columbia, more than any other province. The systematic nature and range of abuses carried out by male and female missionary teachers have been described as a means to degrade the psyche of Aboriginal children. More recently, and maybe you guys have seen in the press and maybe perhaps on Al Jazeera, very patient historians who spend a lot of time in our archives have identified that children were also a part of nutritional, nutritional experience, experiments where they were deprived of milk and food, and many girls and women underwent forced sterilization. There is still a lot that we don't know as Canadians. So as former students raise their children and grandchildren, the intergenerational effects of abuse and familial fra fragmentation are evident among Aboriginal families, particularly where abuse and substance misuse is widespread. There are currently 80,000 residential school survivors still alive in Canada, and many of our study participants in the CEDAR project are the children of these survivors. We have over 800 plus young people who work with us in this community governed cohort study. And as I mentioned, this study was initiated in 2003 and it's still ongoing. Um, participants at enrollment are between the ages of 14 to 30. We meet with our participants every six months. We ask drug use stuff, sex stuff, um, injection stuff, sharing needles stuff. Uh, condom stuff, but we also ask more recently um, issues related to PTSD, the impact of racism on health, and also um, more recently a real push to address strengths and resiliencies. We also do HIV and hepatitis C testing at each visit. It's important for me to know that it's also a closed cohort. Now, the picture that you see here on the right is a meeting that we had with our governance called the Cedar Project Partnership. The people that you see here from left to right, Sherry Kouyak is a Cree woman from Saskatchewan, Mary T.G., who, who I'll speak about a bit later, she's from our, our Prince George and she's a carrier woman, and this is Chief Crick Wayne Christian, a, um, a chief of his nation in the shoe shop. All of these people are um, key to our work. Since the study's inception, our governance was keenly interested in prioritizing measures of historical traumas and their relationship to infectious disease. At baseline, we asked whether participants had a parent in residential school, whether they had been removed from their families into state care, and whether they had experienced childhood sexual abuse. 45% of CEDAR participants told us that they had at least one parent who had attended residential schools, and about 30% didn't know if their parents had gone to residential school. 65% told us that they had been taken away from their biological parents, and the median age of first removal from their parents was four years old. As a member of our governance, Chief Wayne Christian, who himself was a childhood sexual abuse survivor, felt it was critical to address the impact of these intergenerational traumas. However, bringing the extent of abuse in families and communities into the public view was a decision that our governance did not take lightly. As a result, over a period of approximately one year, we met at least four times in face-to-face -face meetings to get the results of the paper appropriately interpreted and to release it to the press without blame, shame, or judgment. Almost half of our participants reported sexual abuse and the median age of their abuse was six years old. Sexual abuse was associated with having a parent who attended these residential schools, was it was associated with um, being in the foster care system and with HIV infection. 
Our indigenous governance controlled the whole media and messaging process, while local, national, and Aboriginal print press picked up, picked up the story. It was because of the radio messaging that our work was heard by Indigenous people all over North America. We were contacted from far away as Nunavut, which is way north, if you, if you remember from S6, that map of Canada. Um, but we were also contacted by nations in the United States, in particular nations in South Dakota. Um, we were also contacted by law firms because many people are dealing with class actions and also um, circle sentencing, which is a form of, of Indigenous justice. This process was critically important to our governance membership because Indigenous people rarely get the opportunity to control their own messages and representations of themselves. Our governance also directed us to examine the strengths and resilience of their young people because despite everything that had been done to them, after 500 years of colonization, not only were they surviving, they were thriving. Each time our, our participants come in for a study visit, we ask them about their involvement with traditional culture, their own language, and ceremony using questions that were actually designed by elders and knowledge keepers who were part of our governance. We also assess their level of resilience with a validated questionnaire. What we found affirms what our elders already know, that even among people who are facing drug-related harms and complex traumas, having connections to culture and language was associated with higher resilience. So despite the residential school and all of the childhood traumas, we know that Indigenous traditions, languages, culture, and spirituality have survived and continue to form the basis of young people's strength and resilience. As you are all aware, I'm sure, most governments and funding agencies require an evidence base to justify funding. So consequently, our collaborators were able to take this data and lobby on behalf of their own children. Our mortality paper was a very difficult paper to write, publish, and release. Our participants have died awful deaths. But I'd like to make a couple of points about how this paper was released to the media. Way back, I think it was 2002, 2003, when we first published Indigenous content um, into the Canadian Medical Association Journal, which is our journal for our, our National Medical Association, and fairly high impact. I had to really wrestle with the editors to include one sentence about the international um, or about the intergenerational traumas of the residential school system. One sentence, but we got it into the paper. And it was important because it meant that, that was citable, that that trauma was now in the medical literature. Now, just before publication, this publication was released in the same journal. 15 years later, no, 12 years later, one of our key spokespeople, Mary T.G lost her son in a hunting accident. We felt we couldn't move forward through, we, that we couldn't move through the press release without her because she's a key spokesperson with our governance, has a very powerful voice, and the issue of mortality was really, had become a reality of her own. So we called the Canadian Medical Association Journal and got the paper delayed in its release. And that to us was, wow, what a difference between 2003 and, and I think this was 2017. Um, so that negotiation allowed her time to find her voice through her grief. What shocked us, as I mentioned, is that they did agree. When she was ready, she did the press together with Chief Wayne Christian, and this story was picked up by more than 200 media outlets across the country. Since this analysis was done, and the feathers represent the ones we've lost, um, we've lost 40 more participants in probably a year and a half. And I think you guys have heard or you've seen in the press issues related to the opioid crisis and the fentanyl crisis and it's hitting our study badly. So let us turn now then to the Changle the Etch 
study, a longitudinal cohort initiative here in Northern Uganda. As many of you are probably aware, the protracted civil war in the North involving the Lord's Resistance Army resulted in widespread atrocities, human rights violations, and death. In March 2002, the, UBT, the UPDF launched Operation Iron Fist against the LRA encampments uh, across the border in the Sudan. In turn, rebel fighters poured across the border and sought revenge against the civilian populations. Communities were massacred, numbers of child abductions, numbers of displaced escalated. Um, when I first started working in Gulu in probably 1998 to 2001, there were probably about 480,000 80, people living in displacement camp settings. But by 2005, there were over 1.6 million. After 2006 and the cessation of hostilities agreement was signed, people did move back to their ancestral homes. At that time, district officials um, were really concerned about the drivers of the HIV epidemic and thought that they could change quite rapidly. They felt that an aggressive and deliberate approach to evidence-based research and program design as the previous encamp to resettle was critical. In 2011, in 2011 uh, is, is supported in large part by Professor Sumon Combo and many colleagues actually from MRC, Chamaliwa, and the Rakai Project, together with our northern colleagues, uh, we began, began a five-year cohort study, um, which again was funded by the Canadian government. To our knowledge, it's the only study of its kind in a post-conflict setting in sub-Saharan Africa. So why the name Chango Liech? Is there anybody that speaks Luo here? Sure. Okay. Hi. Why the name Chango Liech? Okay. Chango means hilly and Liech means elephant. And in the Choli land, the elephant is their symbol representing strength and unity. Because of the protected war or protracted war and many epidemics, Ebola, cholera, HIV AIDS, and Hep B, the elephant has been seen to be ailing and a bit weakened. It is, it is hoped that the Chango Liech Healing the Elephant Study can help in some small way to rebuilding strengths in Choli Jund. So this particular study has over 2,000 people involved. Again, it, is a, it was a five-year cohort, but we, are, we have received more funding, which I'll explain a bit later. We were involved in Noya, Muro, and Gulu districts, and again, this was a collaboration between the north and the south of Uganda. There are very few Canadian investigators involved. I think it's probably um, not a surprise, but HIV infection, um, was higher among women and was higher than the national estimates suggested. HIV infection was also associated with war-related trauma. And probably not so surprising is that sexual assault in the context of war or being raped during the war was associated with a two-fold odds increase in HIV infection. <coughs> This critical finding may help some controversy in the literature raised by conflict epidemiologists who are challenging conventional wisdom about the role of violent sex, about the role that violent sex plays in conflict settings as it relates to HIV infection. There's a guy, maybe you guys know him, his name's Paul Spiegel. He's a UN guy. He published a meta-analysis and basically said there's no evidence to support the fact that um, rape during war influences HIV epidemics. There is a, a scholar from South Africa, her name is Rachel Jukes. She hit back at Paul Spiegel in the literature and said, basically, man, you're crazy. And there was definitely a back and forth in the literature. And I think it, it, if memory served me correct, it was in the Lancet. To our knowledge, ours is the first study. 
even though it's just cross-sectional data, to support their response by Dukes that sexual violence fuels HIV epidemics in complex settings. It must be noted that, that at the time of our study, there were limited to no services available for women surviving sexual assault, including access to post-exposure prophylax prophylaxis. We must do better. Again, contrary to popular perception, the formerly abducted were not more likely to be infected at baseline than those who had experienced displacement camp living. There was a popular narrative, which I, I'm sure you guys remember, and it was certainly um, fueled by the international media outlets. The, girl, the girls who were abducted and taken to the bush were nothing more than sex slaves and passed from man to man to man. This just wasn't the case. In the bush, women were given to a man, but one man, and they lived by Choli values and norms. Having sex with a premenstrual girl in a Choli is tremendously taboo. In fact, as the war went on, the LRA were abducting younger and younger girls. This was presumed to be a protective strategy against HIV infection in the bush. This also led girls le left behind to seek out early pregnancy so they wouldn't be abducted by the LRA. These cycles of abduction impacted everyone and the impacts of the cruelty were profound. Unfortunately, in a recent analysis that's being led by Dr. Achilles Kataba, we have found that abduction is associated with HIV seroconversion. And we believe that that's associated very much with the stigma that girls who came out of the bush with their babies have experienced when they've been home. That work is ongoing. Now, I won't spend too much time here because I know our time is limited together, but the Canadian Institute for Health Research funded us or gave us the opportunity to bring together the two studies in some way under the same conceptual framework or umbrella of the same conceptual framework. So we, we have seven years of funding to now really look at vulnerabilities, yes, but also really take a look at strengths. Because in Canada, a lot of the work that's being done with Indigenous people is really shifting focus, moving more towards let's, okay, so we've identified the vulnerabilities, but what are the resiliences of people who have survived tremendous stress? And this is the focus of our next seven years together. Now, I'm very sure that many of you in your training are very familiar with concepts such as culturally sensitive, culturally appropriate, um, culturally competent, and the new word now is cultural humility. And these terms, indeed, are extremely important to our interaction with research participants. However, cultural safety as a term was first offered by nursing researchers working with Maori people in New Zealand. The core tenet of culturally safe research is the acknowledgement of the impacts of colonization and power imbalance. Many people globally experience historical traumas related to racist policy, loss of language, culture, and traditional lands and territories. These issues in turn impact experiences with healthcare research and healthcare encounters. So in the CEDAR project, which is the indigenous study at home, what does cultural safety look like? Our field offices are police-free zones. Our indigenous and non-indigenous staff are trained to suspend judgment and do understand that drug use is a form of self-medication for emotional and spiritual pain. One of the leading members of our governance hunts and fishes for our participants. So while they are surviving the streets, they get access to traditional foods such as moose, elk, salmon. I think um, for people surviving the streets in Canada, most of their diet, diets are high, high in carbohydrates and they get little access to protein. We hold memorials for those who died we feast, we celebrate, and we keep in touch with participants in prison. How am I doing? 
Five minutes? Okay. Tangle Lance is a much newer study, but it's equally important that our processes are safe and trauma informed. Developing, the, the, developing these processes are ongoing. However, we do know that 10% of our cohort were, were formerly abducted. But we also know that among our research team, there are members of, of our team that were formerly abducted and who did survive the displacement camp living. We need to keep our team safe as well. So, we talk about, there's a, a few more slides and I've been told that I have five minutes. So, I want to know whether you want to talk about culture as innovation, culture as knowledge translation, um, or reciprocal accountability. <laughs> Which one do you think? How about culture as knowledge translation? Yes. Yes? That's something? Okay. I'll go there. Thank you. My biggest learning from working with the CEDAR project came from using the ceremony for knowledge translation. This initiative just blew my mind. Potlatch is a feast and ceremony, as well as a form of governance that it is used in many First Nations communities throughout BC. It is also a form of bearing witness to an important event, business, a death, and reconciliation. In 1984, it was made illegal through the Indian Act as part of Canada's goals to assimilate Indigenous people. This ban was in effect for 65 years. In order to return difficult, sensitive study results to our participants, their families, and community, our governance decided that the ceremonial was the only way to go. It was really the only way that we could have an open discussion about those awful results regarding sexual abuse because families were present, and also residential school survivors. We invited our staff, governance, our participants, their families, and community members. Over 200 attendees came, and for our study participants, this ceremony had a profound effect. So, so many had been distanced from family, culture, and their plans for so long. Part of the potlatch is a massive giveaway, Gift giving is a key part of honoring the witnesses and those there to do the work. We honor the CEDAR partners who guide and govern us with gifts of blankets, vests, and shirts. We honor participants and witnesses with blankets and dry goods. We gave away hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of sugar, salt, flour, rice, and vegetable oil. And I think the spirit of giveaway is very much a part of ceremony here in Uganda too. The person who delivered the toughest part and the hard to hear stuff from our work was a study participant. She talked about her own sexual abuse, her experience with the foster care system, her own addictions, and the challenges of mothering through it all. But she also delivered a message of hope. And this is the message that you see here. In Chango Liach, This picture is a, is a very recent meeting we had with approximately 200 years of leadership. Um, our, the ways that we're disseminating, disseminating information are, are more standard, more meetings format. But we are exploring a Choli ceremonial to see how we can give back information to families in a way that's more consistent with their worldview and ceremony. I'll wrap up by saying that um, that the truth and reconciliation process in Canada has been a really, really good thing, however painful. And it's really my hope that one day the people of Acholi Land will be able to have that same experience. So thank you for your attention. And um, please, if you have any questions, if we have time. Yes. Okay.